Welcome everyone. We're going to do a, a restorative pranayama practice and um, this week I really wanted to kind of dive into pranayama. Sometimes I feel like it gets shortchanged with um, these weeks. So we're going to save about, I'm hoping to save about 30 minutes for pranayama. And you just want to make sure um, that you're in a space that's quiet, that's warm. Um, you have all the props that you could ever need around you. And it's, um, we're going to be practicing yoga for about 30 minutes, but if you want to put socks on after that, um, sometimes, you know, your body cools down once we're not doing the yoga asana. So um, you might even want to have socks and a sweatshirt nearby as well as an eye pillow. So we always should do asana before pranayama if we are not doing pranayama immediately upon waking up. So we don't want to ever just kind of jump in the middle of your day into pranayama practice because it won't really take. So the nervous system has to be kind of settled and soothed before pranayama is able to be received and help us at all. So we're going to do restorative practice and hopefully get the nervous system on board. And then we'll do several different pranayamas um, to really get us nice and quiet. And I absolutely love pranayama. It's um, really my, probably my favorite piece of this practice. Um, and so hopefully you either know that now and you love it too, or you're starting to, to find um, the beauty of it, um, or eventually you do, I wish that for you. So we're gonna start seated and just kind of getting centered. So make sure you have enough support and you can take your less dominant cross-legged position and just take some time to move flesh out from under you, kind of drawing the flesh from under the sitting bones and back diagonally trying to balance your weight from right to left and also from front to back, using any support you need to help you align your shoulders above your hips. See if you can really plant your sitting bones deep into the floor, anchor into the legs, try to surrender your legs, don't let them grip or float up. And then just start to feel kind of a corresponding lightness to the torso, a little bit of a buoyancy that comes out of that really established foundation of this pose. Without changing the position of your shoulders, join the hands in front of the heart, closing the eyes and looking toward your cheeks. And I named this practice abiding by the breath and really pranayama isn't a forceful striving thing. It's really about listening and gently responding, gently refining. It's a very subtle and delicate practice. So the first piece of really starting that work is to become more attentive and attuned. I think I called the practice attuning to the breath, which is what I meant to say. So we're just kind of tuning in. Letting yourself really come into your body, onto your mat, into this hour in your day. Letting go of whatever else the day holds for you, just putting that aside for now. giving yourself permission to fully be here. When you're ready, bowing toward the heart. Release your hands, let your head, let your eyes come open and welcome. Now bring yourself into child's pose. You can take whatever support you might need for that pose. Make sure your knees are wide enough that your torso can come down. The feet are together. And if you want support to feel some sort of connection of your buttocks to your heels and you don't make that directly, then put something there to close the gap. So you feel really anchored. 
And if the floor feels like a reach, tuck something under the forehead, make sure you can still breathe. Your nose is free and clear. Welcoming the length of your spine to open, feeling the sacrum moving away from your skull, feeling the breath kind of expanding into the back body, broadening between the back ribs. The compression of the front body is gently forcing the breath into the back body. Pointing your tailbone gently down toward the floor. Using the length of the arms to encourage length to the sides of the torso. And gently gripping the floor with the toenails just to feel slightly more anchored toward the back end of the pose. So that you have something to extend away from and you create more resistance in the body. And then start to gently leave the pose and come up. We're gonna take seated hero pose. So creating enough support underneath your shins that you'll be comfortable. And run the length completely from the knees to the toenails, unless you're modifying for ankles, which sometimes we do. In that case, you drop the feet to the floor right where the ankle is and the feet are on the floor directly. Sometimes people need that. Otherwise, a continuous line of support and sitting bone support. And then adjusting your legs, calf muscle out, under thigh in, kneecaps pointing forward. And just like in Sukhasana, you're taking some time to arrange yourself so that you have the alignment, the shoulders in line with the hips, the skull above the spine, feeling really evenly long to the front and back body and taking the shoulder blades gently toward the chest. As you press into the soles of the feet, just encouraging the foundation of your asana to really feel anchored, anchor your outer shins toward the floor, anchor your small toes. And without disrupting that foundation, raise the arms up. Try to fully straighten your arms. And sometimes you need to go wider to do that. You can take more of a V shape if you need a little bit more width to straighten the arms. And as you extend up through the fingertips, really draw the shoulders down toward the hips, somehow keeping the side body very long. And then grabbing your elbows, inhale, lift the elbows, exhale, tilting the right elbow down, the left elbow up without disrupting the balanced feeling of the shins. Keep your shins very even. Inhale back to center. Re-extend the arms to change the crossing of the arms. And then exhale, tilting the left elbow down, the right elbow up. Continue to take both elbows slightly back. Encouraging breath to sweep into the right side body. Inhale, center. Extending the arms. Exhale, turn to the right. So your left hand comes to the right thigh, right hand comes behind you, propping it. If you need to elevate the hands, you don't have to lean back to reach the floor. Keep the chest really in the sunlight as well as you can. Turning the head for the last few breaths. With the sense of quiet in the face and the eyes and the jaw and the tongue in the throat. 
Inhale, center, raise the arms. And exhale, other side. And inhale, come back to center. And exhale, bring the arms down. We're gonna come into a head supported downward facing dog. So you might know approximately what you need for your head. You might need, you might know that you need to modify this pose. So we're gonna hold it for a couple of minutes. You might need to take standing forward bend instead or chair supported forward bend. So you have those options. If you know you're unable to hold downward dog for a longer period of time. The head support should help you though to hold the pose. So take some time creating the height you need. And when you're ready, come into your head supported dog. Try not to bend the elbows to meet the propping. So build the propping up so that you don't have to bend the elbows or distort the pose to reach the prop. You can also grow the distance between your hands and feet if you need to come into the props a little bit more without bending the elbows. The back of the neck should be long, there's no crease. You're resting closer to the crown of the head. And the contact of the crown of the head should be light, not forceful or heavy. Every time you exhale, gently draw the shoulder blades in toward the chest. Every time you inhale, draw the hips away from your wrists. And try to roll your inner knees back and try to draw the outer knees in toward midline. You'll be here about five more breaths. If you can hear your breath, really pay closer attention to the sound, the rhythm, as much as you can notice. Become very interested in the breath. And go ahead and place your knees now, sit back. Rest the forehead. Not a very active child's pose, just taking a moment here to let go of that downward dog. So the work we're doing here is to restore balance between the body and the brain. The body is considered inert, sluggish, dull. Um, tamasic is the word we use and so the practice of asana brings the body into a more energized state. In turn, the mind is considered rajasic, hyperactive, anxious, overworked. And so to balance the mind, the practice of yoga starts to quiet the mind. So this is why it's essential to do this asana work before we come into pranayama. So we're gonna come into a seated position and take a, a yin style twist. You can sit on a blanket and just have your legs kind of bent. The leg position is really just whatever feels stable. Your knees are bent and both feet are off to the right. And we're just gonna start with our hands down kind of in front of the left knee and your torso angled forward. And one of the key ingredients to this yin twist is that you put a third of your body weight, if you can imagine that, into your hands. So it's a lot of pressure in the hands. And then keeping that pressure, you're gonna to start to crawl the hands toward the back of the mat. 
And your body will let you know when there's enough twisting action, you'll pause and breathe. Your head is just kind of passively bowing. And really the effortful part is the pressurized hands. And as your body says so, you'll just kind of continue to crawl the hands farther back, bow the head. Eventually you might see the bottom of one of your feet. Twisting, as we know, is one of the most effective ways to wake up the spine and as a result, the entire energy body. I like to think of, we've all played with those fluorescent bracelets and necklaces that you have to crack to get them to glow. And when I do twist, I think of that glowing pink, yellow, orange, green, whatever it is. I feel like my spine starts to glow. So keeping the weight of the hand, start to reverse out of this big twist, lengthening through the crown of the head as well to keep the length of the spine really kind of encouraged. And then just sweep the legs over to the other direction. And again, it's really not about a precise arrangement of your legs. It's what feels stable. And then you're gonna bring your hands over kind of out in front of the right knee. Pressurize your hands and then find your first edge walking back. I'm spending a few more moments here, maybe four or five more breaths. A hip that's really deeply against the floor. Try to relax into that pressure, not resist it. Get a nice little massage to the connective tissue there. And then you'll start to come out on an in-breath, keeping the hands heavy and slowly creeping back around and out of the twist. We're gonna set up for a head supported wide seated fold. So this is where you may need a chair if you know from the past or you know your back is kind of stiff or your hamstrings are stiff, that your range of motion coming forward is pretty limited. A chair seat will be your, your best friend here. No matter what, we want to get the head supported. So another option, if the chair seat's a little too high, but you're still a little bit uh, limited, is to create an incline, uh, either a bolster or a blanket on some blocks. And you have levels of blocks to work with so that incline can be as big or as, as, as high or as low as you want it to be. <clears throat> and I always suggest that you turn your blanket to a corner because you really sit down better in the legs if you're just your tailbone has the elevation. So for this pose, the sitting bones, we really want to not be on the blanket. So you're really just on the very tip of that blanket corner. So you might have to play with that height a little bit. You might have to stack a block under your bolster or blanket. You, you, you can get creative, as creative as you wanna be with your props so that you build height to meet you. Make sure your nose is free and clear when you do find the right setup. We don't wanna be smushing our faces into the setup. That's not the idea. So begin sitting upright. Your legs are wide. You're pressing your legs into the floor. So the torso is gonna to be passive. The legs stay active. And then don't let your legs rotate as you come forward and take the first edge, which might not be very far. So just give yourself 
a lot of um, give yourself a generous amount of support and you can always reduce it as you hold the pose. You can use your arms as well, cross them and rest your head on the arms. We know forward bends have the potential to encourage that dull, innate, tamasic nature of the body because they're forward bending and you can kind of feel like a slumped over ragdoll. So it's important to keep the legs active. The legs, quote unquote, prick the consciousness awake. That's an Iyengar statement. We have to prick the consciousness awake, otherwise we become dull. We go into that screensaver mind where you're wandering and not really present. So keep the legs active and firm. And then the skull, the brain, the torso is restful and passive, surrendered. And as you stay present, you might notice you'll need to reduce the height under the head. quote from Light on Pranayama, the yogic art of breathing, BKS Iyengar. The tree of life is said to have its roots above and its branches below. And so it is with man for his nervous system has its roots in his brain. The spinal cord is the trunk descending through the spinal column, while the nerves run down from the brain into the spinal cord and branch off throughout the body. The practice of asanas strengthens the nervous system and the practice of shavasana soothes ruffled nerves. If the nerves collapse, so does the mind. If the nerves are tense, so is the mind. Unless the mind is relaxed, silent and receptive, pranayama cannot be practiced. We'll continue here just another minute. And then gently inhale, begin to come up. We will do this pose to each side now. If you're using a chair, the chair goes over your right leg. You'll be resting over the right leg. If you have the setup, you don't need the blocks if you were inclining because your leg will create more height. You can put your prop setup over your leg. The goal, the idea is to get your chest as directly over the right leg as you can. That being said, it probably won't be perfect, but we're turning in that direction. So just kind of push the setup up out enough where your nose is free and clear. And you'll come into your right sided Upavishta Konasana. And now the really, we want both legs pressurized, but especially the one you're not looking at. So especially the left leg is really anchoring here for you. See if you can transition to your left side, like you're trying to tiptoe out of a room someone's asleep in. So you're really just trying to move over there without 
the brain noticing without the body getting all ruffled up and see if you can quietly transition. So the action really is right leg here and the continual turning of the trunk to keep trying to point out at the right uh, left leg here. Every single pose has a effect on the breath. So in all of these poses, hopefully you get to a place where you can just really tune into the breath. I'm gonna gently come out of the pose and set up for cross bolsters. So we've been doing forward bends. Now we're gonna do a mild back bend. So as you transition to set up this reclining pose, just try to be very gentle and conservative with your movements. It'll be the X shape on your mat. So if you have a bolster, you can use that. Otherwise, you're working with rolled blankets. And the top part of the X is the one that should be running with your spine. The bottom part is horizontally crossing the mat. And you may know that you like a little bit of a head support here. It should be low though. So it's mostly just for padding. It's not so much for height. I like to put a loop around my ankles. It's not required, but it does contain your legs. So you don't have to be as active with your legs, which can sometimes create agitation, which is of course not the point. So you have to decide if the strap is useful to keep your pose in a quieter state. If it's excessive and superfluous, just skip it. And when you take the strap around the ankles, if you're doing so, you should see that your feet are just a little bit wider than your hips. You'll sit on your setup so that your hips become the peak when you recline back. Your hips are the highest point the head and chest and shoulders should all be kind of descending toward the floor and the neck should be long. And whether or not you have the strap on the ankles, you want to find your heels grounded, your toes pointing up, straight up, not out to the sides, and your kneecaps looking up as well. And if you can pressurize your heels enough, you can use that action to consequently help the tailbone rise toward the ceiling, which is the action we need to keep our lumbar long, to keep the flow of energy along the spine fluid and not congested. Back bends are uh, very seductive. So really do your best to keep your inward gaze pointed toward the cheeks away from the brain. So just finding the exact right amount of effort And then just showing up witness to your breath. I like to use the image of a fountain head for the breath in back bends. Just kind of watching it rise and spread. 
spread across the chest, even up to the collarbones. Keep checking in with your gaze pointed down and keep a softness across the brow line in the temples, descending the temples, softening the throat and the jaw and the tongue. So we are gonna quietly leave or transition. You're gonna be sliding up toward your head side. So if you are in a strap, just kind of help your feet find their way out and then shift your way so that your butt comes down onto the floor. And you can take your legs and just kind of cross them and use the support of your cross bolsters to elevate your legs. And after five breaths here, just simply change the crossing of the legs. You're going to help yourself roll off to either side of your mat. And we're going to be doing a couple of seated pranayama practices first. So what I usually recommend is take the height that you use for centering, which we do at the beginning of every class, and add a little more. And you can always use a wall behind you. We do a lot of our pranayama practices reclining because the seated ones take more effort. So we usually learn them reclining, which we've done. And then we start to <clears throat> apply the practices to the seated position. We're gonna kind of go backwards. We're gonna do the seated practices first today and then we'll finish with reclining because my goal is that we're gonna go really deep and really quiet. I think I built too much height here. And so I want you to kind of get a little more passive um, as we go here. Most of the practices we're doing today are down regulating. We will do one uh, practice that is more energizing. So this is where you'll start to cool off. So put socks on, maybe a sweatshirt. Which I'm crawl crawling off to get mine as well. And just take some time with your seated position Classically, the seated pranayamas were done in full lotus pose for many of us that would absolutely agitate the brain and the body. But if that is your preferred seated position, go ahead and take your full lotus pose. So take care of your legs. If you have knees floating, thighs gripping, hips gripping, put propping there, maybe soft blankets under the knees or around the hips. <clears throat> The first practice we're going to do is Nadi Chodna, alternate nostril breathing, which is a great way to start pranayama practice because it's very balancing to the body. Um, it's a practice that can be done any time of day, several times a day. It can energize and it can soothe the nervous system. So it's very versatile. And whether or not you're right hand dominant, it's always done with the right hand. So just fold in your index and middle fingers you'll be working with your thumb and ring fingers to alternate the closing of the nostrils. What happens is your elbow likes to kind of squeeze into the side body. That's really congestive to the armpit. So imagine you're holding a tennis ball in your right armpit and you try to maintain that position with the elbow kind of flared out. Sit up tall. 
you're going to be alternating the blocking of the nostrils. So just begin by inhaling fully through both. The top of the breath blocking the right nostril, exhale the left. Inhale the left. Top of the breath block the left, exit the right. Inhale the right. Top of the breath close the right, exhale the left. Inhale the left. Closing at the top, exhale the right. Inhale the right. So what you're doing is you're taking the breath in the one side, releasing it out the other. You'll start to notice differences with blockages in the nostrils, maybe clarity in some, blockages in the other. As you're inhaling, if there's a blocked side, feel free to use the free finger, the one that's not pressurized against the nostril, to pull the flesh out away from the nostril to open the cavity more so that you can start to take more clarifying breath. Throughout the day, the, the closure changes from left to right throughout the day. So we're always a little more closed on one side than the other. Okay, so just continue, watch that elbow, watch that armpit. Your chest is raised, your chin is close to the chest. Your eyes can be closed for pranayama. The ears are receptive and open and listening. two more cycles here. And when you exhale the next time, go ahead and release your hand down. You can just kind of rest the backs of your hands or fingers against your thighs. And that gentle pressure helps you move the shoulders back, lift the chest, close your eyes if you haven't done so already and just take some time always with any pranayama practice just to notice any effects. I always notice that I feel like my nose is very clear and that's okay if that's not what you notice, but whatever you do notice, just take note of it. Notice what you notice. Now we're gonna come into Brahmari next, which is the bumblebee breathing. And before we get into the breath pattern, um, we're going to learn the mudra, which maybe you already know. Mudra is a hand position. The mudras are not just decorations. They're functional. They direct energy. This mudra creates sort of a mask for your sen uh, sense organs on your face. And so the, the thumbs will be what plugs your ears. The index fingers along the brow line, the brow ridge. The middle fingers will seal the eyelid shut. That means you're not pressurizing against the eyeball itself. You're sealing the eyelid shut with the middle fingers. The ring fingers float right outside the nostrils and the pinkies right outside the lips. And if you feel uncomfortable with this, sometimes people feel a little bit claustrophobic here or for other reasons they don't enjoy this mudra, you can just kind of take your four fingers on the top of your head. You'll still use your thumbs to plug your ears. That part's really essential because that's how we hear. We kind of create this vacuum of sound inside the head that only we can hear and it's very soothing. So let go of the, the mask for now. And the breath pattern is basically the buzzing sound, bzzz, but your lips are sealed. Mm, so it's kind of like a humming. If you imagine your tongue inside your mouth, it's kind of lifted from the floor, it's pulled back and it's quivering. And you don't have to really um, consciously do that, but that's just kind of the, the image if it's useful to you to imagine how your tongue is moving here. So what we're going to be doing is three exhales with the buzzing sound. Of course, we all breathe different lengths. So after those three exhales with the buzzing sound, you'll sit again with the backs of the hands against the thighs, just noticing the effects. And then you're going to repeat three more cycles. So we'll kind of um, be at our own pace. And of course we can't hear each other, um, but you, after those three, just sit quietly when you're ready to begin again, you can, you can start your final three. 
So go ahead and put the Shanmukhi Mudra on. It's again, thumbs to the ears, index to the brow ridge, sealing the eyelids shut with the middle fingers, ring fingers, nostrils, pinkies, lips. And don't worry if you don't touch the nostrils or lips, it's just kind of bringing attention there. Elbows out to the sides, chin and chest are close together. Big breath in, plug your ears, begin. Mm. Primary brings a sense of stillness. And if you don't have that here, then the advice is to do more rounds. Um, and that's for your own practice. Today, we're gonna move on to our reclining pranayamas. So as you're ready, let your eyes come open. We're gonna create uh, some height for the lungs. So you're gonna take your blankets and you have two blankets, hopefully. And you'll open them up so they're a little bit larger and longer, and you'll try fold them. And you're going to do two of those. So bolsters are okay, but actually the more square surface is better, the flatter surface rather than rounded. And you're going to stagger these blankets so that your lower back has that first little height. And then the thoracic spine has the two blanket height. And then finally, you'll just kind of roll the top to create additional height for the head. And I find it easier to build that in once I'm defining because then I know exactly what I need to get my chin and chest together. If you're cold, put a blanket over you. If you wear glasses, you don't wear them for pranayama or shavasana ever. Um, you can put them aside somewhere they're not gonna be stepped on, although we're not in a classroom, so probably nobody's walking around your mat right now. And then eye pillow, some people find useful if you have bright lights over your eyes, that can be one reason, or your eyes really, it requires effort to keep them closed. Just a light amount of weight um, or a sleep mask is another good one. In a pinch, you can use your strap from your yoga props if that um, 
is what all you have available. So you're going to come onto your back and your butt should be free and clear of the blankets. If you have a shorter torso, you don't need a lot of that lumbar support. Longer torso, you need a little bit more of that first layer blanket. The thoracic is getting another layer, the two layers. And then the head, of course, I kind of think of a snail. I roll it, I roll the blanket so that it tilts my head forward, my chin and chest uh, come together passively. And then essentially you're just creating the Shavasana shape, encouraging the shoulders to come down, the shoulder blades to lift, the backs of the hands are resting, the feet are passively falling out toward the small toes. And your gaze is pointed away from your brain. We're gonna practice Ujjayi exhale, Ujjayi inhale, and then we'll see if we can put them together. The Ujjayi inhale is the one that is upregulating. So if you're feeling kind of um, low energy, low mood, um, then you want to do that. Otherwise, the rest of these pranayamas are very downregulating and soothing for anxiety or restlessness. These are very brain quieting. So just find the muscle in the back of the throat, the same one you use to clear the throat. And see if you can just kind of control the constriction of that muscle until you create kind of a white noise sound effect on the exhale. You're not going to breathe in that way. So for now, we're just kind of focusing on the exhale. And essentially, when you constrict the muscle in the back of the throat, you're slowing down the passage of breath. You're narrowing the passage. It extends the breath. It helps us control the evenness of breath. We can hear it. So we're painting a layer of sound on the breath that otherwise we probably maybe couldn't hear. And so you're just really trying to create this very fluid, slow, soft release of exhale. You don't wanna harden the abdomen. You don't wanna overdo it and ripple the breath or kind of over constrict the throat. So it's again, very fine, delicate practice, very subtle practice. The utmost goal in pranayama is that you're not agitating. We are trying to soothe the nervous system. So if what you're doing is bothersome or it feels like a chore, just come into breath observation, which means you're not altering your breath or conditioning it in any way. You're just being with the breath. So just practicing your exhale ujjayis. The practice of pranayama should not be mechanical. The brain and the mind should be kept alert to correct and adjust the body position and the flow of the breath from moment to moment. One cannot practice pranayama by force of will. Hence, there should be no regimentation. Complete receptivity of the mind and intellect are essential. Take a few more attempts with these exhales. If you've come back to just observing the breath, just stay with that. And now we're all gonna find our way back to just a few rounds of your natural breathing. We're going to apply the same technique with the throat on the inhale, not the exhale. So ujjayi inhale. This helps us extend the length of the in-breath. Again, watch for eyes rolling up, temples hardening. Keep the throat soft, even though you're constricting it just a little bit. It's a very subtle constriction. Listen to the breath. 
attuning your ears to the sound of your own breath. You might find that every inhale is a little too much to make these attempts. Maybe alternate every other in-breath. Breath is like a turbulent river, which when harnessed by dams and canals will provide abundant energy. Pranayama will teach the practitioner how to harness the energy of breath to provide vitality and vigor. So come back to breath observation, leave the ujjayi inhales, notice any effects, make those subtle fine tune adjustments to your position if you need, to your gaze. So we will attempt to connect inhale and exhale with ujjayi breathing, but maybe not every cycle. So maybe breaking the cycles up or the attempts with round one or two rounds of unconditioned breathing. So begin when you're ready. When you inhale, try not to inflate the abdomen higher than the rib cage. When you exhale, make sure you're not hardening the abdomen. Wherever you are with the practice, finish up this last round of ujjayi, inhale, exhale, and find your way back to unconditioned breathing, automatic breath, breath observation. Without the sound of the breathing, the ears sharpen with their attunement, they become more receptive. This is really what takes us inward. All the other sense organs are dialed down. Conserving your own effort, you're going to find a way to move off to the side to remove the pranayama supports to come on to the floor directly and maybe just leaving a little bit of a head support so that your neck is in alignment 
your forehead no lower than the chin. Coming into a final Shavasana. Feeling not only your body moving into the floor, but sensing the floor rising up to meet you. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things break and all things can be mended. Not with time as they say, but with intention. Love intentionally, extravagantly, unconditionally. The broken world waits in darkness for the light that is you. Just take these final moments in Shavasana picturing the light within you, the peace, the stillness. Maybe sensing how this work that we do is really a benefit for others, for the world, not just for ourselves. I'll just take a few more Lengthened out breaths, inviting yourself gently out of the pose. Letting the body start to gently move, letting the movement trickle in from the outermost points towards the center. And when you're ready, help yourself to one side. Without any more effort than is required, bring yourself to seated. And from there, joining your hands in front of your heart, Inviting a sense of gratitude. Let's take a breath in through the nose and let it go. From a place within me that I know to be divine, I honor that place within each of you. Namaste. Everyone, have a wonderful week. I'll see you soon.